so you said when you're looking at pictures now and you're going through the years you can kind of start to identify things that you saw your that when you look back it becomes a little bit does it become more obvious as you look back uh, yeah yeah i mean i i couldn't tell you then but it's uh, it's more obvious to me now this might be a dumb question but do you think that that has to do with the fact that we don't get taught anything about this kind of stuff we meaning and and maybe it's more prevalent now but you know um I, I did a, a, a couple podcasts on here um, about um, Lewis Puller, Lewis Puller Jr. He was the son of a famous Marine, the most famous Marine named Chesty Puller. And Lewis Puller was, um, he was, he, his dad, Chesty Puller, was like the, the most iconic Marine ever. And he received five Navy crosses and he, the, Here's a good way to describe how iconic he is. He, uh, the Marine Corps has a, has a, uh, uh, what is it, a mascot, and they've had one. It's a bulldog, mm-hmm. and yeah, the mascot. I think they're on number seventeen, but the mascot is named Chesty. And at boot camp, they sing, uh, "Good night, Chesty, wherever you may be." That's what they do in Marine Corps Buka. So this guy, Chesty, pulled the most iconic Marine of all time, and he had a son, and his son was. Uh, not quite cut from the same cloth as his dad. You know, his dad was this kind of gruff guy and this son was sort of a more mild guy. He wore glasses. He went to college. He uh, was just more of a cerebral type guy and he gets done with college and he's not really sure what he's gonna do with his life. So he decides, well, you know, my dad was in the Marine Corps, I'll go join the Marine Corps. So he goes to join the Marine Corps. He can barely get in because his gla- his eyesight's bad. The people that are looking at his application are like, wait a second, this says Lewis Puller Jr. Are you Chesty Puller's son? He's like, yep, no, but we, we can get you in. So he gets in the Marine Corps, goes through officer candidate school, goes through the basic school, and then it's 1968, so he goes to Vietnam. And when he gets to Vietnam, um, going on rotations in these three different spots and eventually uh, goes on an operation and he steps on a landmine, gets severely wounded. He loses both of his legs. He loses a bunch of his fingers and dexterity in his hands, almost dies. I mean, it's just a miracle that they were able to keep him alive and he, he, he does stay alive. Um, comes back to America, you know, devastating for his dad the great iconic marine hero is breaking down when he sees his son. <sighs> Chesty Puller, um, Lewis Puller, you know, eventually recovered from his wounds and uh, wrote, a, wrote a book called Fortunate Son, which is an incredible book. And, and sort of, you know, he was, he'd gone down the path of alcohol and being an alcoholic and all this and, and um, eventually comes out of that, writes this book, the book gets published, and in 1994, he fell out of his wheelchair, injured himself, went back in the hospital, um, they put him on painkillers, he got addicted to painkillers again, and and he killed himself. Mm. And what was, when I, when I did this series of podcasts about this, what was crazy was, Every single Marine, every single Marine, 100% knows who Chesty Puller is, but a vast majority of Marines that I talked to as that podcast was coming out did not know the story of his son. Mm. And it seems like the perfect way to educate people about the hardships that people face when they come home from war and they you know obviously Lewis Puller had a multitude of hardships as well but it seems like the education that we receive and not just us in the military but then the families that there's things hey this is what we need to be looking out for mm-hmm. and it it seems like if you're if you now are looking back at pictures to be able to say man I see this, I remember this, 
these are the kind of things is this like like part of the things that you're trying to share now so that people have better education about this kind of stuff oh my gosh yes yeah yes and again i'm no scientist i'm no doctor i don't have research under my belt but i have what i've lived and sitting in my chair having been with this person for so long you know we we I didn't just like meet a team guy and then we got married and that's not to bust on anybody that did. But, you know, I've I've known him almost his entire life. And then to watch him through his career and then to lose him in this way, I didn't see all these signs and symptoms prior. I think if Chad, I want to believe that if Chad thought something was wrong with him, that he was probably trying to hide it from me. I have other girlfriends, widows, whose husbands took their life, and they have said that their husbands expressed to them the struggle they were having and and what they were thinking about and, you know, their signs and symptoms, and I didn't have that. And it's not going to be the same for everybody. We're humans. We're all different. The whole biological DNA, it might express itself differently. But if we could maybe educate people a little bit more about the toll your service takes and um, and to know that even if you're not killed in action or killed in training or you don't die by suicide but you've led a very active career you are going to be impacted some more than others and let's really have a conversation about what you might see and, and when is it going to be really pro- when is it really a problem mm-hmm. 